the average job seeker looks for a job for six to nine months, which means they probably go on 20 or 30 interviews. If you're the average hiring manager and you have low turnover, hopefully you're only interviewing once a year, maybe three to five candidates, especially if you have HR involved. That means that the job seeker sitting at the interview table has more experience than you. So if you want to get better at interviewing as a hiring manager, you have to practice. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. Now, as you know, our theme for this season is take bigger swings. And sometimes, just sometimes, that means doing a job interview or interviewing somebody to join you in whatever you are doing and building, whether that's an entrepreneurial venture or within a large corporation or a smaller corporation. Interviewing is so important. It's one of those things. I think we've all done it. But I got to tell you, like nobody gave me any training on how to do interviewing. And I have to say, I have made plenty of mistakes. And so many times you interview somebody and frankly, you miss something or you just don't know what to ask. And then when you're making the hiring decision, you think to yourself like, oh, I wish I'd asked this question or that question. Or on the flip side, when you are interviewing, you know, nobody really teaches us how to interview. So this is a really important topic if you're gonna take bigger swings. And that is why I'm joined today by Anna Papalia, the author of the new book, Interviewology, The New Science of Interviewing. Now, Anna is a career influencer with over 1.5 million followers across social media platforms. She's consulted with Fortune 100 companies, taught at Temple University, and coached over 10,000 clients on interviewing better. It's really impressive stuff. She's also a public speaker, and she just talks about this in a way that is so practical. Now, the bonus, beyond all these other good reasons to have her on, is that she's originally from Maine. So it was funny. We were talking before the show, and it was just exciting to hear that we grew up probably about 40 minutes from each other. So I love that. And you can tell she is a Mainer through and through by her, just her way of being. So that is what we're going to talk about today. As you know, I'd like to start every episode with the same question. So we started out with this. When I asked Anna, tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. I think something unexpected I learned about myself is that I'm an entrepreneur. (laughs) I I never really expected that. I was in the corporate world and really saw myself excelling through those ranks and abruptly had sort of a come to Jesus moment in 2011 and left my very comfortable corporate job to start my own business. You know, I too am an unexpected entrepreneur. I was so corporate and then the corporate world like blew up so many times that I had to find another way. And I think that's, it's a good thing to recognize, but it takes a little while, doesn't it? To like believe it that, oh, wow. I mean, I wouldn't say I was an entrepreneur for like five years. (laughs) I remember even before starting my business, looking at people who had their own business and think, oh, well, I could, I could never do that. And then I found myself thrust into it. And it's one of those things in life where y- you don't even think you're ever going to do. And then once you're in it, you're so grateful for it because it has stretched me and challenged me to a point where I have been able to discover incredible things, not just about myself, but in my field. And I know I never would have been able to do that if I had been in the comfort of a biweekly paycheck. Yeah, totally. So tell us about, you know, you're an entrepreneur. Tell us about what you do, because I think that'll that'll frame up the entire conversation today. Absolutely. So previously, I was a director of talent acquisition. I was responsible for hiring everyone in at the organization where I worked. It was a fabulous insurance brokerage. I loved my boss. I loved all of the executives that I partnered with. I created intern programs. I hired everyone from mail clerks on up to executive vice presidents. And I had this moment where I realized that I had a little judgment fatigue and I was, I found myself in interviews wanting to help people, um, even on phone screens, wanting to help people with their resumes. And I resigned. I told the president that I'm young enough and I have some money saved. And if I don't do this now, I'll regret it forever. I just, I want to teach job seekers and hiring managers how to interview better 
which was really a totally crazy concept, right? But it didn't exist in the corporate world. And I knew that if I wanted to do this, I had to forge my own path, which was somewhat terrifying because at the time I didn't identify with being an entrepreneur. And a couple months into starting my own business, the dean from the risk management department where I had hired all of my interns called me and said, hey, you know what our students are doing right and wrong? Why don't you come and teach all the students how to interview? And again, I also didn't think I was a teacher at all. I never thought mm. that. I'm not very patient. So <laughs> like, this should be interesting. And it was actually the perfect experience for me to develop this skill set, this burgeoning coaching mentorship. If I wanted to consult and teach people how to interview, it was the perfect opportunity. So for six years, I taught three three-hour interview skill workshops a week, did hundreds of mock interviews, thousands of resume reviews. And in that process, process. And I consulted with large companies. And in that process, I discovered, like most teachers, you wrestle with this idea, like, I don't know if all, all these students are getting it. And, and why, are, why are we doing it this way? And I really longed for tools back to research and science. Because if I thought back to the way I hired in the corporate world, there's nothing to help you. 90% of hiring managers aren't trained to interview. With all of these realizations happening at the same time, I had a light bulb moment, I realized, what if we don't all do this the same way? So I started collecting research and I discovered interview styles. And I wrote a book on it and that's coming out January 30th called Interviewology, the New Science of Interviewing. So Anna, the reason why I got excited about having you on this show, besides the fact that I found out you're from Maine, just like me, so that obviously makes it extra special. But the reason why is because like everybody else who's listening to this show, I have been on the receiving end of a bad interview. And I have also, I'm going to probably, you know, it's probably true. I have probably been a bad interviewer. And so I thought about this is like one of these things, you know, you don't think about it. You're like, you know, you don't really, you just sort of like, wow, this is just like pain that I have to go through. But I remember when I was in college, I was interviewing with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York for a job I didn't particularly want, thank God. And at the end of the interview, the woman said, uh, the hiring manager, she said, oh, you know, you know what I really love to do? I love to ask a fun question. And my fun question to you is this, what a person living or dead would you want to have dinner with? And I had not prepared for that. And I remember I answered with a young boy during the Renaissance. Now, why I said that, it sounds so creepy, really embarrassing. And I walked out of the interview and I was like, that interview did not make me feel good. And by the way, I'll never ask somebody a terrible question like that ever again. I am certain, however, that I have made people, you know, on the other side, just through not knowing what to do, have made people feel a little uncomfortable as well, not in a creepy Renaissance boy way, but just in a way. And so as a result, like what I thought, like many of the things that I cover on FOMO Sapiens, I was like, this is a great topic because I need the help. So it's like, you are, you know, you're going to, you're going to fix me today. Now talk about the problem. Let's diagnose the problem. I mean, because I'm clearly part of the problem, but wh what is this like? What is going on out there that you want to fix? So number one part of the problem is, is that 90% of hiring managers are never trained to interview. Often hiring managers go into interviews woefully unprepared because they haven't been trained. And in addition to that, they're following the pack or they're doing what other people have done or how they were interviewed previously. Often hiring managers go into interviews not reading the resume and certainly not creating great interview questions that come out of the job description. They are not tapping other people. There's not a team of people. We know that making complex decisions about who to hire alone is incredibly difficult because we rely on our biases. And the more ambiguous a process, the more biased your decision. And if you're doing it alone as a hiring manager, you're almost guaranteed to make some serious mistakes. And we know how expensive those mistakes are. So I want to do a couple of things. My book is geared towards both hiring managers and job seekers, because mm -hmm. first and foremost, an interview is a set of questions. And the more you know yourself, the better you'll do. Even as a hiring manager, if you understand your style, you therefore understand your biases and preferences, which is so important. And I want to give people a framework, a language to talk about how we interview. And I also want to elevate this conversation why? It drives me crazy. Isn't this the craziest thing that the most important business decisions we make in, in our companies 
are in interviews. It happens at the interview table, yet we don't give hiring managers training and we don't have any tools backed in science and research. And that's why I do what I do. Yeah, and it, I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but these skills aren't just for hiring, you know, a, a person to be on your team or whatever. It's also for choosing an investor, you know, thinking about all of those folks that are, it's like, because when you're choosing an investor, say you're raising capital, you kind of hiring them in a sense. I mean, you're you're giving them a return on their capital to be your you know board member or whatever, or to you know have some power in your company. So this is something that the things we're going to talk about have broad application. Now you have these interview styles that are really core to the work here. Why don't you tell us about the four styles so that we kind of have a common vocabulary together? Certainly. So what I discovered in my research is that, first of all, we all expect that everyone interviews the way we do. I went in with the hypothesis that I'm really good at this. I used to be the director of talent. Everyone that's good at interviewing must interview like me, right? I I figured that there was going to be a style that was better than all the others. Well, luckily, I'm really happy and humbled that I found out that that is not the case. And I found out that there are four distinct and unique ways that people go about interviewing. And one of the biggest realizations and and light bulb moments for me throughout this research is that I am a charmer. That's the first interview style. Charmers prioritize. Well, I could tell that already. (laughs) Charmers prioritize making a connection and they want to be liked. Mm. One of the things I found so fascinating in my research is that the opposite of a charmer is an examiner. And they do not go into interviews wanting to be liked. They go into an interview wanting to be seen as qualified. In fact, they look at interviews like a test that they're either going to pass or fail. And I had to interview and talk to over 280 people before I got it through my thick skull that indeed, in fact, some people go into interviews not wanting to be liked. They want to be seen as qualified. So then we also have challengers. Challengers go into an interview wanting to be respected and heard. And challengers like to ask tough questions. They look at an interview like a cross-examination. In the way a charmer looks at interviews like a performance and they're the star of the show, challengers are there to figure something out, whether they're a job seeker or a hiring manager. And then lastly, we have harmonizers. And harmonizers go into an interview like a, tri- like a, t- a tryout for a team that they want to join. They are always thinking about the group and the company and the department, and they use a lot of terms like we and us versus I and me. They're collaborative and they're warm. And as you can see, they are the polar opposite of a challenger who's like, this is who I am. They want to be heard. They want to be themselves. They're constrained by integrity versus a harmonizer who really just wants to adapt. FOMO. FOMO. What's so interesting about this and I think the aha on me moment for me on this is like how <laughs> everybody's coming into it. Basically, it's like I'm supposed to be interviewing for a job to, to bring somebody to my company, but I'm really making it all about my own sort of fears, weaknesses, needs, desires, you know, so it, it, it it's just interesting how when you step back and think about the psychology of this stuff, it's like if you are a needy person you're you're really not even you're focusing on fulfilling your needs more than fulfilling the needs of what your your role is. Now, let me ask you a question. Which of the four do you think I am? I think you're a charmer. I mean, <laughs> it's not hard, but yeah, I think you're right. But is there now okay, so we know that. Now, what do we do with that information? It's really important my entire book is based on the premise that all of the previous interview advice is kind of bogus, right? It's telling mm-hmm. you to memorize these perfect answers or do this just to get the job, just to get your foot in the door. And that's just really the old way of doing that. You know, I think it's it's really terrible advice. Where else would you give someone that advice? Pretend to be something that you're not, right? So instead, I encourage people to build up and facilitate their self-awareness so they understand what their baseline is. So if you know, for example, you're a charmer and you prioritize making a connection, those obviously have some great strengths. But as I unpack it in my book, we also have overused strengths. And as a charmer, some of our overused strengths could be we rely way too much on connecting, telling stories, being liked, telling jokes. And in a job interview, we lose sight of the fact that we should be telling them how we're qualified or talking about projects that we've done or things that we've accomplished. So for each interview style, I unpack strengths and overused strengths and what you can do 
So you can know who you are in an authentic way and you can work from that baseline rather than just shifting and pretending to be like some people ask me, you know, if you figure out that someone in an interview is your opposite, sh- should you pretend to be that or lean more into that? No, it's, it's about like shifting a little bit, obviously, in interviews, right? Using your emotional intelligence. You don't want to pretend to be something that you're not. But there are times when you have to sort of quiet that a little bit as a charmer and know, I'm interviewing with an examiner right now and he wants to know the facts, the figures and the details. So I got to get really granular for this person so they understand me better. Because if you're just talking about telling stories, <laughs> it's not, you're not going to connect with that person. Yeah, I'm just thinking as you talk about this, I remember one time, so I am a charmer and and I, and that sounds arrogant, but you get my point uh, under your definition. <laughs> And uh, I was interviewing for a job in finance and private equity with an examiner, uh, probably a bit of challenger vibe as well. And he was like, what's your best skill? And my best skill in general is connecting with people. And so that's what I said. But that was not, you know, he wanted a guy who would come in and say, I'm really good at finding great companies to invest in, which I was also good at. And so I, if I had sort of been a little bit more thoughtful about what is he looking for, and instead of just defaulting to the areas that I kind of am most comfortable I could have given him a better answer because it wasn't like I was faking it. I had been doing that work, but I just chose to put the spotlight in the wrong place. Does that sound right? That's an excellent way to put it, to put the spotlight in the wrong place. And when we need to make a connection with someone, especially someone who's hiring us or when we're hiring someone, sometimes we just need the help. And I love the way you said that, you know, put the spotlight in a different place for them. It doesn't mean that you're not being charming or you're, that isn't your strength. It just means you're going to shift it a little bit so they can understand you better, sometimes soften those edges just a little bit. And the thing is, what I discovered is that it is really hard to hire people who are our opposites. It's hard Mm. to hire diversity. It's hard to hire people who think differently than us and That is one thing I hope that this language helps us do. In debriefs, for example, I've been with hundreds of hiring managers that would say things like, "Eh, I don't really like that person. What I hope they would say instead is, you know, I was really hoping he would give me a more specific answer about some of the deals he's worked on, but instead he Mm. talked about connecting. He must be a charmer. Doesn't mean he's not going to be great at the role. And in fact, I have three challengers and examiners on my team. I need another charmer. So it gives you that language that you need to understand and also how you can plug in and get some diversity on your team because we need that diversity of thought as well. Oh, 100%. And we always talk about on FOMO Sapiens that if you have a VC firm and everybody's name is Tad and they all went to Dartmouth, that is um, that is a missed opportunity because Tad is probably going to agree with Tad. And then when Tad comes in the room, Tad is going to agree with him too. And so you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities to dig a lot deeper and have other kinds of thought. Now, when we think about those, I'm curious, like one of the things I think people who listen to this show contend with, and I certainly do, is FOMO sapiens do a lot of things. We're not one dimensional people. We, you know, we do, oftentimes we have careers where we're working for ourselves and we have a bunch of different things we do. We also have things outside of work. We have like complex. It's not the old narrative. I worked at JP Morgan for 32 years and I'm here interviewing now to work at Bank of America. No, it's like people's stories are complicated. That's not that unusual in this day and age, given the fact that you know, we have just, are, the way people work has changed of digital nomads. Like so many people are solopreneurs, so all that sort of stuff. But, you know, as an expert in this, like how would you recommend to people when they walk into that interview and they have a complicated story. Like what is the best way to communicate that without sounding like they're all over the place? Practice. Hmm. Practice. You know, it depends on your interview style. Um, Specifically, challengers think that practicing takes away some magic from their interview answers or that they put this weird pressure on themselves that they're going to do better on the spot. That is just an excuse you tell yourself not to do the hard work of practicing. Every great athlete, every great actor, every great person that does anything gets good at it because they practice. And why do you put so much pressure on yourself if you haven't been in an interview in eight or 10 years and you're like, I'm just going to come up with these answers on the spot in an intimidating boardroom with an intimidating executive? practice. Prepare and practice all of those interview questions. Why should I hire you? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Tell me about yourself. Practice. And don't just practice it in your head or write it out or look at a spreadsheet. Open your camera app and record yourself answering standard interview questions. It's magical. 
It's like mm-hmm. having your own mock interview. And of course, you can hire a career coach, someone like me, or recruit your husband or wife to help you, or a trusted mentor. Practice, practice, prepare, and practice. And having a complicated work history, almost everybody does. To your point about we all have a complicated relationship with work and things have gotten really messy post-COVID. We could talk for hours about all of that. Practice, practice your narrative. Tell me about yourself. Put it into a formula. I always coach my clients on saying a little bit about their past. What are they currently doing in the present and what do they want in the future? And spoiler alert, the future is always, I want to be at this company and why? FOMO. FOMO. That's really good. And it you, it forces you to edit. And what you said about the camera. So this is, it's, it's a, such a good piece of advice because I remember the first time I did like TV stuff when my first book came out and I was doing whatever it was. And I was, I thought I was pretty good. Like I'm a charmer in the interview room. Why can't I be a charmer in media? And uh, my, uh, my agent was like, you have to go to this woman and she'll train you up. So I went to her and her name's Catherine and she recorded me. Her husband was an actor. So he asked me questions like we were on a TV show. It was kind of ridiculous. But, <laughs> and then I, we watched the video together and Catherine looked at me and she said, Patrick, you look dead behind the eyes, mm. which was, she was English. This was in London. And so I was like, wow, this it reminded me of like the, you, you know, the, you are the weakest link goodbye or whatever. Or she was just, owl. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty harsh. However, she was right. And having watched that, I, and many times and then recording myself and practicing, I have been able to improve. Now, it is weird and uncomfortable to watch yourself on camera. However, lean into the uncomfortable place because that's where the growth happens. And it's such a good, it is such a great tip. I love it. Okay, practice, practice, practice. Now, let's talk about, uh, you know, if you are an interviewer, okay, and you want to be you know, you want to get the best out of this conversation. You really want to get some insights. Do you have a couple of like, you know, really great questions that you could kind of give us that we should always have inside of our, our sort of toolkit? No. And I don't. Oh no. No. What? (laughs) Tell me more. Audience, there's no silver bullet. In fact, to build on my earlier point, Let's think about it this way. The average job seeker looks for a job for six to nine months, which means they probably go on 20 or 30 interviews. If you're the average hiring manager and you have low turnover, hopefully you're only interviewing once a year, maybe three to five candidates, especially if you have HR involved. That means that the job seeker sitting at the interview table has more experience than you. So if you want to get better at interviewing as a hiring manager, you have to practice. And that means, like I said before, 90% of hiring managers aren't trained to interview, so what do you do? You think deeply about the position. You think deeply about the team and the job description, and you create great questions pertinent to that role. So I can't come on here and say, okay, here's the one thing. In fact, I hate it. I hate those headlines that say, this CEO has the one question that's going to like help you always vet the right candidates. There's no such thing. I've been in over 10,000 interviews. And what I have learned is making really difficult decisions about who to hire doesn't get easier. (laughs) It's, It's harder. So what we know is that ambiguity leads to bias. So the more structured you can make your interviews, the better. And this is not fun for charmers because we like to have unstructured conversations, but it's actually the worst way to make a decision in a hiring process. So what you're going to do is you're going to come up with great interview questions and you're going to ask every single candidate the same questions, make it more scientific. It's incredibly Mm. hard to compare and contrast candidates when you took one to breakfast and you just had a conversation and the other you had a Zoom interview with and the other one came in and met the team. How do you compare those three people? You can't. It's, It's almost impossible. So making it more scientific and more structured is unfun and it's unsexy, but it's the way to hire better. And it makes the decision part more fun because makes it- you're so right. You're so right. When uh, when you interview three people and you don't ask the same questions, you come out with, and then you sit in the room and you're like, you know what? I should have asked this person this thing. Whoa, I really screwed that up. Like now I don't have the data I need. And you start to be like, well, you know, it was fun meeting that person for a drink, but like I didn't really do my job. And then, so what happens? They default to, they hire who they like. And Tad. then- they hire more TADs. And let me let me give you a little research here. You know, speaking of the TADs, this was very fascinating to me 
it, when I was collecting research, when I was building out, so I consult and I train hiring managers how to interview better. And this is something that shocks everybody. You know, if you're given a homogeneous group of people, the TADs, to use your example, mm. you have 10 TADs sitting around a table. Our human brains think that we are going to be more comfortable because they're the same age and they're the same race and the same gender. And you're going to be more comfortable to share things, right? Unique about yourself with the, all the TADs because you're all TADs. And yeah. actually what the research shows us is that that is not the case. In fact, when you're in a homogeneous group of people, you only overemphasize the things you have in common. This is where groupthink comes from. Mm. So if you want a team that is more creative, more innovative, a better team, right? Add diversity, add yeah. a different gender, a different race, and a different age. And what the research shows us is that everyone in the room shares something unique and comes up with a creative perspective because they feel as though they can, because there's different people there. But you don't feel as though you can share something unique about yourself when it's all Tad's in the room. Yeah, and you know, I I, I can pick on Tad because I'm a Tad-like dude, and so I, it's okay. But I and there needs to be there are lots of good Tads out there. But that the problem is, as we know, is that when people don't use your methodology, which I'm convinced sounds pretty amazing and I will start using it immediately, then yeah, you you end up having, and we see this all the time, like, oh, this, <laughs> this company, something bad happened and then they had a horrible response. Why? Because nobody was in the room to question the the bias or the sort of like oh we'll just do this like this, let's do no you if you don't have people in the room who have a different viewpoint especially like dealing with intergenerational or or things around uh, diversity or age or gender whatever it is if you don't have folks who can sort of put themselves in a different pair of shoes and think a little differently then you are walking into a lot of pain and so it's really critical now and I want to ask you. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about how our good friend ChatGPT and all of the AI stuff kind of plays in to what you're talking about. Because while these things are exist in the real world, the things we're talking about, it, I do. I was just hearing, uh, I heard on some podcasts, like the number of companies that are now using AI kind of stuff or technologies, all these new technologies to just go through, sort, blah, 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 blah. And I have to imagine people also are going on ch chat GPT to come up with interview questions. So like, how should we just, you know, how should we just be informed about these trends so that we can factor them into our preparation? Well, I am certainly no expert on on artificial intelligence or chat G GPT, but what I do know is I am an expert on coaching and helping people tell their own story and empowering people to tell their story. And I can imagine, and I've had some clients tell me, well, I put my answer in or I put the interview question into chat GPT and I got out this answer, right? That might be a good framework or it might be a good baseline to work from, but I know yeah. one thing for sure, chat GPT can't tell your story. And you should never, like I said before, memorize interview answers because you think, okay, this is the perfect interview answer. I'm just going to say this in the interview because that is not how humans connect. And as far as I know, we are still humans having an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation in an interview. And maybe in a few years or five years or 10 years, we'll get to a place where we will be interviewed by robots, but we're not there yet. So that means that you need to Really understand yourself, like I keep saying, and know how to tell your story through practice and preparation. And sure, you can do you can use lots of tools to help you um, practice those answers and sort of finesse them and get the best version of it. But I would never ever recommend you know memorizing some answer that ChatGPT gave you. It's not your story. You know, someone finally asked me. Uh, I was just finishing my book and they said, oh, you, you didn't even need to write a book. Nowadays, you don't have to do that. You could just put it into ChatGPT. And I laughed and I said, I thought about it for a second. And I thought, well, ChatGPT doesn't know my story. Yeah. Yeah, I weave my personal story into the book. So, and that's what an interview is. It's you. Who are you? Yeah, ChatGPT is really good at being convincing. It's not good at being Correct. And it certainly cannot do that. It makes everything, at least at this point, very anodyne. And you are so right. I hadn't thought about this, but you're, you, it's true. Like all, all of the stuff we've been talking about, if you go back into the core of it, it is stories. 
and stories that are written by you. And so when you practice your story, but, we, but the, ironically, like oftentimes we don't tell our own story very effectively. So that's where the practice comes in to get that story to be really tight. Now, Anna, I want to go to our lightning round. I'm going to ask you four questions. And uh, some people decide to give me like a 19 minute answer. If that's what you need to do, go ahead. But a little quicker is, is always good in, in this interview format. So are you ready to go? I will try to be super concise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. All right. Number one, what is your favorite quote? The only way to escape a problem is to solve it. Ooh, I like that. It's really nice. Do you know who said that? Alan Saporta. Wow. Okay. Very good. Number two, name one book besides your own that every FOMO sapiens should read. Oh, I'm sure everyone listening has already read it. Good to great, all-time favorite business book. There we go. It's a classic. I like it. All right. Number three, what is one piece of advice you would give your younger self? Ooh, that is a, that's a tough one. Keep doing what you're doing. I would say that I live by the philosophy to make myself proud and uh, I had a pretty tough childhood. I moved out at 15. Um, I got into a really great school. I waited tables. I put myself through school. Mm. And I remember years and years, basically my entire 20s, feeling very uncertain and scared and you know, living paycheck to paycheck and not knowing if it was going to get me anywhere. So I think I would go back and just say, you're going to end up where, where you want to keep the faith, trust the process. I am not a trust the process kind of girl. So mm -hmm, me neither. go back and probably <laughs> tell myself that. And I try to encourage myself, you know, like, look at all that you've built. It's okay. You know, it, it's a momentum, much like good to great, right? You keep pushing that flywheel and then the momentum catches. And uh, back when I was much younger, I because I came from so, so much uncertainty and, and such a troubled place that I didn't have a framework to rely on. You know, I didn't have this like core structure and I didn't have some of those things that a lot of kids come from. So that's the advice I would give myself. That's good advice. I, I, I would give it. That's one I should give to myself as well. I agree. Final one. What is your most important memory? Important. Mm -hmm. What do you mean important? <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> hmm. Probably a memory that I hold near and dear to my heart. Important. I start immediately thinking about the birth of my first child. Mm. I've thought many times that is a memory that I never, ever want to lose. And of course, I've had amazing things happen in my life. Incredible things joyous, wonderful, fun successes and things like that. But I will never forget the moment my son was born and I felt like I was hit by a bolt of lightning of love. I remember that feeling like, oh my goodness, I was just bowled over. And I often think I never want to forget that, that memory. That's a great way to end. Amazing. Okay. The book is called Interviewology. Now, if you want to go get this book or find out about all this amazing stuff and follow Anna on socials, you want to go over to theinterviewology.com. You can find Anna on all the socials, including Instagram, where she's at Anna Papalia, and on TikTok, at Anna.Papalia. She's just all over the place. So go check her out. She's amazing. Anna Papalia, author of Interviewology. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstra. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.